Hello, Dr. Fixmaster here. Uh, we're going to install a swamp cooler in my garage. <clears throat> uh, I live in Arizona, very hot here, and my garage just turns into an oven in the summertime. So um, an evaporative cooler usually can't keep up with the kind of heat that we get around here, but after the sun goes down, uh, the way I figure it is if I have a, a, an evaporative cooler, which is much cheaper to operate than refrigeration, which I also have on the main house, uh, I can turn my swamp cooler on, vent it into the attic, and just use that cheap cooling to uh, <clears throat> provide an assist for the, for the main AC to cool it off at night so that the AC doesn't have to work hard all night to keep the, the house and, and cool off the, the roof tiles and everything else. So I've started. <clears throat> right here, as you can see, uh, I've torn off the sheetrock inside the garage. Uh, this is a load-bearing wall, uh, so I have to be careful. Uh, I'm only going to have to cut one place. Uh, this stud right here is going to have to get cut out. So I'm going to have to, to, to put another 2x6 up here or you know, whatever you have. I've got 2x6s, but uh, I'm going to put a a two by six header up here to take the load up above. And when I do the cut, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to nail something across right here, a two by six across. Put three nails in each one uh, so that it doesn't move when I cut this loose to to put the opening through. And I just measured the swamp cooler opening, put it here, and uh, it's a little tricky on the on the other side of the wall because I've got the the cooler opening coming this way through that hole. Uh, but if you measure it, measure it distance from the ground, you can get a, kind of a round guesstimate as to where that's going to be. What I've end up, ended up doing, so you don't know exactly where it's going to be because it may not be as level outside or the, the same, at the same level as the garage floor. So I've been taking this and uh, just poking holes through there, which I can see on the other side, and then I can line that up with the swamp cooler uh, edge. And you always want to guess with a kind of a smaller hole at first. I know I know for sure that I want it to be centered uh, around this stud, and so I've I, I know that this distance over on the side is is accurate. But uh, I got to be careful with the one on the bottom. So I just looked outside, and I need to go down a couple of inches. So I'm going to do another row of holes down here and just see how that lines up. And uh, as soon as it does line up, I'm going to use my little sawzall. And uh, it's just a Black & Decker cheapie, but I'm going to use that to get, cut the actual hole when I get to that point. Okay, there's the machine that I'm putting in. And this is the stand that I built to put it on, cut, painted it the same color as the house. I use these new kind of, uh, of structural fasteners that are really, really good at boring deep holes. They have a self-drilling tip on them. Uh, I found that they still needed a, an assist with pilot holes, so I drilled those and it worked out really well. So that's a good sturdy, you know, I got a two, four 4x4s four holding the thing up, so it's plenty strong and I reinforced it around there. You can see what I've done. I just put uh, one inch plywood on the top and that's pretty straightforward, so I won't spend any time there. So I got that done. Uh, looking behind here, you can see this array of holes that I've got lined up and uh, you can see where I put them and I'm just trying to to gauge over here on this side where that I've just set it up on the platform so that I can see where it is but that the bottom of that band lines up you know the, the opening I'm going to need is about two inches lower than the, the bottom of this band you know down around here somewhere and so on this side I come in here and I look for the band. I need to go to about two inches below it. Uh, so I'm just kind of eyeballing it right now so I know where to put the hole. It doesn't have to be exact, but uh, you know, I would like it to be close. You'll notice that I'm only cutting on this side. I'm only cutting exactly what I need because I don't want to have to do any stucco repair on the outside. Because uh, you have to texture it. You got to get it to look the same and it's the outside of the house. So you don't want to screw that up. So I'm doing most of my work inside. All right, there's the second row of holes I put because I know I needed needed to be lower. Uh, again, those aren't exactly straight, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to take my uh, I'm going to mark it with a straight line and take my sawzall and uh, 
and cut it. Okay, I had to come down an extra couple inches on the bottom, so that means that my original estimate for where I was going to be at the top is too high. So I'm going to come, I'm not going to cut it officially until, you know, I measure down here. Uh, I want to take out this section right here on both sides. Uh, then I'm going to turn the cooler around, make sure that the hole fits, and then turn it around again and back it off so that I can work on cutting out this stud. All right, here are my tools of choice. I've got the sawzall, and then I've got this rotary tool that has a, a diamond abrasive blade on it, and uh, or it's just a, a bit that spins really fast. It's good for going through stucco. Uh, you can do it with a sawzall, most likely, but you might go through a couple of saw blades. And uh, it's not pretty, but it's uh, it'll do the trick. And then I'm going to seal around that anyway with some caulking when I'm all done. Okay, there's a lot of chicken wire in these uh, stucco panels, so you might need a pair of wire cutters to get the piece out, like I used. Uh, the rotary tool was good at busting up the stucco on the outside, uh, but it didn't cut as straight. What cut the most straight was the hacksaw blade on my sawzall. Uh, but you'll probably go through a couple of those. Uh, the, I had the wood blade on originally and it just uh, broke the teeth off of that, so that didn't work. So I would recommend for the straightest cut, just use a couple of uh, hacksaw blades to get through all the stuff. And just clip the wires off as you encounter them. But you can see the swamp cooler there sitting, sitting there waiting to be flipped around and stuck through that hole. Uh, I'm gonna make sure it fits first. Then I'm going to shore up this load-bearing stud before I cut it. You can see I've turned the cooler around to see how I'm doing with the hole. Uh, got plenty of room on the bottom. Got what looks to me like plenty of room on the sides, just barely, just enough. And. Um, Looks like I'm lacking about, uh, I think I'm going to take about three quarters of an inch off the top. And then I'll be ready to scoot that thing in. This is, <clears throat> this is what happens when your blade gets dull. I had my hacksaw blade on for those last cuts. And uh, eventually it just wore the teeth right down to nothing. And when the blade got dull, it just started shaking everything around. and. Uh, breaking off pieces of stucco, so I'll have to come back and patch that later. Uh, but uh, keep a few blades on hand. You want to keep them nice and sharp when you're doing the cutting. All right, there's the hole, and uh, you know we're good all the way around, so when I can cut that 2x6 that, uh, stud and get it out of the way, uh, I can pull that cooler right in. Now, the, the areas that got a little bit damaged up here when I was cutting are probably not that big of a deal because on the outside there's still some cooler up higher and as that thing comes flush against the wall uh, it'll cover up those holes. I can do all my patching and and uh, stuff on the inside here which is the whole point. I really want to uh, get that thing in the window and while I'm patching everything up on the inside uh, I'll be working in an air-conditioned space so that'll be kind of nice. So the next thing I'm going to do now is cut sheetrock up above uh, where I'm going to put a uh, tack on a 2x6, two, two 2 by 6 widths up above. That's to keep everything in place when I cut this right there. And I'm going to cut it down here, uh, leaving enough room to build the, like the windowsill. And then the header will go up here. And I, and I have to cut up cut off enough sheetrock that will allow me to nail in from the sides because I want it to be secure nail in, nail in uh, of the header. And uh, then we should be good to go. The, and I'll show you what the header looks like later. But it's basically to reinforce uh, the fact that we've got a, I've got a, a house with a, uh, cement roof tiles and uh, these are load bearing members. I'm taking one of them out. One isn't that many, but you still you want to be super careful about that. You don't want your 
garage to cave in because you're cutting out. Uh, if you have any doubts, you should talk to a civil engineer about this stuff and check with the building codes and stuff. But uh, there you have it. So we're ready to uh, put the header in and uh, cut that line. Or cut that line. Cut that. Uh, Okay, I've got the marks made for where I'm going to cut. I'm just going to use a razor knife and cut the, sh cut the uh, sheetrock over and then down. I want to be about halfway across the stud because when I patch it all up with drywall later, uh, I want it to overlap a little bit so that I can nail it in. Uh, so I'm going to cut right in the middle of that up to that line over here on the same, same kind of thing. I cut it too far on this one, but not all the way down. So won't be as strong, but it's just in my garage. I really don't care a whole lot. Uh, so from here up, I'm going to do it halfway across this, uh, this stud right here. This is uh, two two by sixes wide. So one, two. This space up here is going to be for a, for a two by six strap uh, that I'm going to use to take the load of, of this center stud that I'm going to cut. Uh, I'm going to cut it right here. Uh, let's see, that's going to be the bottom of the header. So uh, I'm actually going to cut it up right here where this line is. That's where I'm going to chop. But first I have to get that, that, that 2 by 6 strap in place before I can do any cutting. But I think I'm going to build my header in advance too so I can just put it in and minimize the amount of time that, uh, that the load on, on this stud is just being taken by six nails. Okay, the header is ready. Uh, you can see that I've taken three two by sixes and put uh, half inch plywood spacers in between, nailed them all together, both sides. And uh, yeah, so what I'm gonna do now, I, uh, you can see I've got my, my uh, load bearing strap there. The header's gonna go in right underneath it. So that means that right where this line is, is where I'm going to, let's see, about an inch and a half above it is uh, up, actually no, it's up here, up here. This is where I'm going to cut the, the stud and it's ready to go for that. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut the stud up there. I'm going to cut the stud down here, giving me enough room to build a windowsill ledge type thing. Um, and then I'll show you how to frame in the header. Okay, I've marked the lines that need to be cut. I'm going to cut those with a, a jigsaw. Being careful to right up there, just below that uh, strap, and uh, right down here. And uh, this this strap up here is going to take the load of that load-bearing pillar temporarily. I, I wouldn't trust it long-term, but short-term it's probably fine. And especially because we're, I'm only taking out one stud. All right, now you can see what I've done. The header is in there, and I've put, what do we call these? These reinforcement studs all the way to the ground. That's why you have to tear out the sheetrock all the way down, because you have to support that load-bearing wall, so right up, right up here, right up underneath this header, so that it can hold up whatever the weight's being put. What used to be coming straight down through to here is now being held up by this header. Um, the spacers play an important role. You can see these, I left gaps uh, in the plywood spacers, and that's so that I can feed through the copper line and the electrical power because I'm going to put an outlet down here because this this machine uh, just plugs in. So I'll plug it in uh, on the front side of, right in the wall and uh, the water I'm not sure where that hooks up just yet but uh, I'll deliver that in a convenient way possible if I have to come as conveniently as possible. If I have to I can uh, come down through here or do something else depending on where that thing hooks up on the outside. In my opinion, kind of key to the function of this whole support is when 
I will screw for little tiny gaps up here, and I just put shims in there and then cut them off. Um, so you can cut off the appropriate size shims and put them in there, just so to make sure that it's, it's a nice snug fit right here. That'll make sure that the, that the header doesn't sag before it starts to do its job. This thing right here doesn't need to hold up that center stud anymore because the, the header's doing that, so I'm going to remove this top piece. And then the next step is to uh, construct the windowsill, which is going to consist of another another vertical stud here, windowsill, lays right across the top of that, and then down on the other side. Okay, that part's finished. You can see that I've taken the windowsill. And, oops, I've got a couple nails I need to hammer in. Uh, the windowsill now is supported by the original stud. And I put a, another one out here. Tacked it in. And up on top as well. So we've got a nice... So we have a, a good beefy frame now uh, for the windowsill and for the support of the header. So we're ready to slide this thing in. All right, I've got the the header brace off. Header's in place. Window sill's in place. I stuck the AC through, and uh, it's blowing air now. It's not blowing cold yet because I haven't rigged up the water. I just plugged it plugged it into my regular outlet and. Uh, make sure everything was working but I'm gonna put an outlet right down here I'm gonna do that next and then I'm going to put some uh, I've got some spray expanding foam seal around the edges of this thing it's not perfectly straight but you know it's a garage nobody really cares so I think I can I think I can seal that up with the foam without too much trouble I'm strongly considering not putting any sheetrock back on there. The reason being is I'm kind of space, space challenged in my garage and those uh, gaps where the 2x6s were sitting would be a great place to stack paint cans. <laughs> so I might, I might end up doing that. Okay, the next step, now that I've got everything installed, stuck, sticking through the, the hole in the wall. I need to route water and power. Now I plugged it in on the inside so that you can see uh, that it's working. Uh, but I'm going to route power to it through the attic and uh, make an outlet plug on the inside of the garage so I can just plug it in, in there so that it looks better. And then I have to do the same thing with the water line, which is just around the corner here. So in my house, it's uh, only about well, maybe 20 feet away, but I'm gonna I'm going to patch into it right there, and then I'm gonna route uh, this this copper tubing uh, to to the cooler. This is a uh, self-piercing saddle valve, and I'm gonna it's got a little needle thing underneath it, and we, basically you. Put it over the pipe like I'm going to do right there, uh, and then you tighten down these screws. And this this is supposed to poke a hole in the copper pipe. I'm going to actually do it with a drill bit, so I'm going to turn the pressure off in the house uh, to the line, to the water line, and so I can make a good hole. I, in the past, I've found that uh, these things aren't super reliable, but I'm going to just help it out a little bit and. Uh, put a small hole in the line so that this self-piercing thing doesn't have to mash through the pipe. And then, uh, and then I'll have this little screw valve that goes to the, the copper pipe compression fitting. And uh, I'm going to route water line straight up the house. There's my flag that I got in Israel up there. Uh, I'm going to go up in the attic and then uh, out here to decide where I'm gonna I think I'm gonna feed it down down through the header and uh, well I don't know this this 
this hole right here is for the, the float valve, which goes, this, this thing, and goes in there and as the water level inside of here changes the float valve, opens up letting water in. So my water supply has to come out here somehow. So I, I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to get that done. I've got a little bit of a problem. Uh, this is the level control, so basically it goes in this hole. You can already see the problem. <laughs> I've got wood right here. I'm sitting on top of something. And in fact, it's lined up perfectly with the center of this table, which I've got a 2x4 underneath there. So I'm going to have to get my jigsaw out and get creative and uh, remove this piece of wood underneath and poke a hole through the through the plywood with my jigsaw probably uh, to make room for this thing to go down through. And then there's a, it's kind of like what's on your toilet. This, this will screw down on the other, it'll screw up on the other side. And that will sit down in there with that rubber washer to seal it off. And then the water level will, you know, as soon as the water gets above this, it will spill over. It's kind of an emergency thing. Um, and then, uh, well, let's see. Oh yeah, and, and I can adjust, you can adjust the float by bending the line and, and twisting this so that you, get, you, want, you don't want water spilling over there all the time, but you, you want it about an inch below. So the pump back there can pump the water up this tube, distribute it out to these uh, pads, and that's what gives you cooling action. You just suck air through it and it's a little wet, so it uh, evaporates cool. This is installation hardware that I'm not going to use since I built a platform out of wood. Uh, none of that stuff that came in the kit is going to be used. Uh, these straps and, and these plastic sheets are for covering the sides in a window. I might be able to make use of them a little bit, but uh, you know, that's just cosmetic. Okay, I was able to get it in. I'm going to show you what I did underneath. I um, made a bit of a mess of it, but there it is. You can you can see it where it comes through. So anyway, the big deal is that that just needs to come through. That's the drain. So if it gets higher than this, water spills into it and drains out. So it, it never can get any higher at the level down in the bottom here. Uh, so it's recommended to use this uh, submarine cooler coating in the, the water exposed areas of a new swamp cooler, an old one, you clean it out, prepare the surface and uh, get all the water out of it. And uh, I'm going to put this coating around the bottom, just roll it on or brush it on. Um, and it's just supposed to protect from rusting through because it does have water sitting in it, in it all the time. Uh, over on this side, this pump is usually sitting down here in this bracket. Uh, that hole right there is what keeps it in place with this little plastic plug. All you have to do is pop that plastic plug out, pump slides forward. I'm just gonna set it right up there out of the way while I do the coating on the bottom. So basically this pump just sucks up water from this reservoir down at the bottom and pumps it up through this this hose right here and uh, comes up to the top and through this distribution network out to these aspen pads and uh, the fan just sucks air through it so it's really how it works all right I'm gonna I'm gonna do the coating on the bottom and then we'll get to routing the power and the water Okay, here's the finished job with the uh, the black submarine coating, and um, it worked pretty well to use just one of these mini rollers. And I put uh, two coats on; that seemed to be sufficient. Uh, I've spent some time uh, getting the water pipe down here. That was uh, probably one of the most challenging things, and the power as well. But uh, this video is in for showing you how to 
hammer and nail and saw and uh, each house is different so you got to kind of tackle that on your own how to how to get the power and water out to the thing I got my water line fed up through the ceiling into the attic and it runs over this way to the air conditioner comes down through the plate in the wall uh, down through the header uh, I decided to bring it this way just to because it's kind of hard to bend that uh, tubing without putting a kink in it so you got to be really careful you don't want to go to all the work of uh, routing that thing through your attic and then come down here and ruin it by bending it strange and uh, putting a kink in it so you gotta make sure that your bends are kind of gradual you can buy a bender in the store uh, if you want to those are useful for that can't remember where I put my, oh, it's down here on the floor. I actually have one here. <clears throat> so th this is what a bender looks like. You can buy them at Home Depot for pretty cheap. And that's, you know, you can put any, any angle that you want on the bend. And you, it just feeds through these tracks and uh, instructions are on the packet. I didn't, actually didn't use the bender because it was... Um, it seemed to put quite a bit of stress on the on the actual bend. Let's see where is it? Oh, this this 90 degree bend over here. Uh, I used the bender for that, and uh, you can see it. It I probably didn't do it right, but it's uh, compressed a little bit when it rounds the corner. I can still blow air through it, so it still works. But uh, I was I I kind of was it was a toss up for me as to whether or not to use the bender. And uh, the bends that I put in by hand were just fine. So I'm going to put a compression union, as you can see, it wasn't quite long enough. I had to use another piece uh, to get down here. And I went down through there and I poked a hole in the wall and the cooler's on the outside. So that's my water line. But I've got to, I've got to, to patch this up, I do that with a compression union. And, oops, <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, there are a couple of, long pieces here those get inserted down into each end of the tube uh, this piece in the middle goes in the middle I've taken one of the compression caps off uh, and you can see there's a round sleeve like thing this this thing right here at the top kind of sandwiched in between that goes onto the line itself and then this goes with that hole first onto the line and then it it threads over the top uh, of the tube and screws onto this. And you can see a diagram on the back on how to do it yeah, right there. So that's what it looks like. So you screw on that, uh, you put that sleeve on the end of the of a squarely cut line, put the nut back here and do the same thing on the other side and then uh, with those long pieces inserted into the ends you just stuff those into this connector and then screw those nuts on there and tighten them down with a wrench holding it in place with another wrench right here in the middle uh, so you can get them nice and snug and it's just a compression fitting it seals all the gaps and you can uh, be good to go there these kinds of connections is what we're going to use to hook up the inline filter uh, the scale remover to prevent hard water deposits and um, so all the other water connections are pretty much the same. I'm going to show you the needle valve when I install that, um, just for fun. But uh, that's pretty much how it goes. There's what it looks like um, put in place. So I'm holding that centerpiece with, a, with one wrench, and I'm turning these nuts on the other to tighten it down and seal it up. It takes a half-inch wrench to tighten those down. I was using a 12 a 12 millimeter wrench on the on the inside probably not exact fit but it uh, was enough to hold it in place you can see that I've come through the header and through the plate the wall plate uh, with the power cord as well that comes down by the side I used the 3 8 3 8 uh, drill bit to get through those and then down into the outlet which I've wired up and uh, that will be the power supply for the air conditioner uh, <clears throat> I routed that line over to my uh, 
breaker box, which is on the outside of the, of the garage over this way. Uh, there's my hat. And uh, hooked it up there. The hardest part was feeding it through the wall and fishing it through the hole out there by the breaker. I'm going to install another outlet out there because uh, I don't have one at this point and I would like one and uh, also uh, that allows me because it goes straight to the breaker box to rig up a circuit that will be unique to this cooler and the outlets here and on the outside. The one on the outside I'm going to rig with a ground fault interrupt which is going to feed the entire circuit with a ground fault so if, uh, if there's some kind of a ground fault issue uh, it'll trip the supply on this whole thing, so we're good to go there for safety. I got everything hooked up now. Uh, the wire to the air conditioner comes through the hole into the box. Uh, I take that down into an outlet because I feed that outlet with uh, the line comes from that bottom breaker right there. Um, this is a GFCI ground fault circuit interrupt uh, outlet. So there's a, a line where the power comes in and a load where, where the load wire comes out. The load wire is basically going to the air conditioner so that one is uh, ground fault protected as well as the outlet that I installed in the garage to plug it, in, to plug it into. So I just put an extra outlet out here outside because I needed one. Uh, the hardest part of that was feeding the wire uh, up through the attic getting it down through the plate in here. Every house is different, so I can't really offer advice on that. But uh, you know, this is an electrical instruction video, so it's just a more or less a system consideration for swamp cooler install. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of uh, YouTube videos about how to wire up outlets and stuff, but it's pretty simple. So I'm gonna close that. Oh, and I also, uh, I'm gonna take you over here so that you can see I put a sticker on the outlet here to indicate oops, to indicate that it is ground fault protected. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see that or not, but the FCI protected. The coating looks really good. My second coat looks good. I think I'm going to go ahead and put that pump back in place and uh, put the panels back on and we'll get to go for the to install the valve. The pump slides right back into place, and then you pop this uh, rubber plastic, what you can call it, that little, uh, not a grommet, but that plug, that plastic plug, that just holds it in place. It's really easy to stick back in, and this hose can just go right back on here, and we're set. It's time to cut the copper tube. To do that, you need a cutter like this one, and you just basically screw down that until the cutting wheel makes contact with it, and then you just rotate it around slowly a few times. Make sure the cutting wheel stays in the same place, and uh, tighten it down a little bit each time you go around, once or twice. Eventually, it'll just chop through it. There's the float valve installed. Let's put the pipe there. The tubing. Run through an inline filter to clean up the scale. If you keep the scale out of the water supply, your pads will last a lot longer. Um, I do notice one thing, and that is. Since this is the valve and water is going to be dripping out of there, I'm going to take a small paintbrush and get in here and coat this back part with, uh, with this black goop uh, to protect this area right here from rust. There's the needle valve installed. Uh, I've pressurized the lines and now I'm just walking through and checking the connectors, making sure that there's no water dripping from them. If they are, uh, tighten them or uh, uh, you can loosen them up with the water off and uh, tighten them up again, try and line those up really well. 
uh, the, at the joints so that <clears throat> so that they come in straight and uh, then they shouldn't leak. No drips there, so that one's fine. I've just propped this uh, float valve up so that it's off, just to make sure that I've got good pressure in all the lines to, to look and look for drips. Come down here, there's a drip on that one, so I'm going to have to tighten that up. Also a drip on the other side, I'll have to tighten that one up. And then we can fill this thing and get it to run. Filling the reservoir now, and all you have to do is bend that float. It's just like the one in the toilet tank. Just bend that float. All right, so that the valve shuts off right when the water is at about oh maybe one maybe an inch below the this spillover point, and then you're done. Then you can put the pads back in, run the pump, and uh, you're up and running. I have sealed around the edges with this uh, 3M fire block foam. Uh, you just squirt it in the cracks. See, it, it actually expands to twice the size of what you originally put in there when it's dry. There's a little bit of touch-up I need to do on the back, but that's all sealed off. To go down. And I'm going to call that done. I'm getting beautiful cold air in my garage, and I should be able to uh, employ my garage, even though I live in Phoenix, Arizona, to do more Dr. Fixmastering. Happy fixing. Don't forget to like or subscribe.